After the delightful game that was the legacy of Goku, I'm sure everyone was waiting with bated breath for the sequel. And as fate would have it, we only had to hold out for a year before the legacy of Goku 2 was released. My first exposure to this game came from watching behind the scenes footage of its development. It had to have been a bonus feature on a DVD or something, because this was before YouTube and there was no way I was watching videos online with my crappy early 2000s internet. And to tell you the truth, if I hadn't seen this behind the scenes, I probably would have avoided this game like the plague. In the end, I decided to rent it from the video store in my neighbourhood, which is pretty unusual considering that renting Game Boy Advance games was not the norm back when I was growing up. This store was the only one in the area that offered this service. I popped the cartridge in my Game Boy, not expecting much, and I was pleasantly surprised. It is astounding how much the developers improved on the train wreck that was the first game. To be fair though, it would have been pretty hard to make it any worse. Dragon Ball Z The Legacy of Goku 2 was launched for the Game Boy Advance in 2003. It was produced by Webfoot Technologies, the same company that developed the first game. It was the first and only Dragon Ball Z game created in the United States to be released in Japan under the name Dragon Ball Z The Legacy of Goku 2 International in 2004. The game featured some changes as all the characters were given new profile images and their names were reverted to their original Japanese names. Though the game features RPG elements like a leveling system, The Legacy of Goku 2 is more of an action adventure game. The game opens up 16 years into the future where we will be playing as Teenage Trunks. This short tutorial segment takes place during the events of the TV special Dragon Ball Z The History of Trunks. It's actually really cool that the game does feature this element of the anime, instead of just sticking strictly to the regular episodes. In this alternative timeline, Androids 17 and 18 have pretty much destroyed Earth and killed almost all of the Z fighters, with Gohan and Trunks being the only two remaining. With the first line of dialogue, you can immediately see an improvement to the presentation. The text boxes are larger and easy to read, and also the character portraits are much better. Oh my god! What did they do to your face? It looks like he's been storing nuts for the winter. Perhaps they talk too soon. Some of the artwork in this game still comes across as a bit bootleggy. Before we can be of any use to Gohan in his battle against the androids, we're going to have to first learn how to fight in our role as Trunks. He wants us to use our melee strike to shatter a boulder, and I have to say that this punch feels significantly better than the one in the first game. When you punch, you don't merely stop completely in your tracks, rather you maintain a small amount of forward momentum. This helps to make the attack feel more fluid, which is further helped by the fact that you can also throw a 1-2-3 punch combo. Together, these two factors serve to make the attack feel more natural. When it comes to the controls, these seemingly insignificant adjustments make a world of difference. He wants us to unleash a key blast to destroy the next boulder. Simply tap the button to launch a key blast. We will be able to switch between key techniques once we have learnt more. Key blasts are much safer to use since they can take out opponents from a distance, but they deplete your key gauge. Unlike in the original game, you do not regain key over time. Instead, glowing orbs can be gathered through smashing objects and defeating enemies. After the short training session is over, Trunks valiantly tries to achieve Super Saiyan form, but fails to do so. Gohan heads north after detecting the androids and we pursue him. When we catch up with him, Trunks tries to persuade Gohan to let us join the fight against the androids. He eventually caves and agrees to let him go, but then... <laughs> Waking up hours later in the rain, we can use these flight pedestals to fly to Pepper Town. These pedestals are the only way to fly around levels. They have completely removed the flying mechanics of the first game, which was probably a good choice considering... It's a shame that there's no manual flying within the levels, but they did find a way to incorporate this iconic feature in a much more substantial way, as we'll see in a moment. We discover Gohan being attacked by the androids while running through the wreckage of the town. 
Gohan has been knocked to the ground and has regrettably perished. When Trunks sees Gohan's dead body, the rage within him explodes and Trunks transforms into a Super Saiyan. There is a stark contrast between this opening and the one from the first game. In the first game, during the very first mission, Goku is looking for pornographic magazines that have no bearing on the plot. This game on the other hand provides a solid introduction to the fundamental gameplay and storyline. It's hard to believe that this game was made by the same developers. Back to the present day, we are at the Sun household where we will now be playing as young Gohan, who is eagerly awaiting the return of his father after his defeat of Frieza. Chi Chi sends us to go find our math book, which will be added to our quest log where you can keep track of your current quests and ones that have been completed. We find the book upstairs on the table and bring it back down to the bedroom where Gohan eventually drifts off to sleep. During this sequence we travel through the back of the house into the forest. The movement has been drastically improved. The default walking speed has been increased and you can now even run. I know, revolutionary. But seriously, that's how bad the movement was in the first game. The fact that you can run now is a godsend and even better you can now also move diagonally. Gone are the days where you have to slowly prod your way through the forest. Continuing deeper into the forest, Goku emerges from the mist. Bring the meth. How? How could they get it so wrong? <laughs> anyway, this isn't really Goku and he changes into Freezer, where we participate in our first, I guess, boss battle? The combat at this point does feel a bit like you're just trading slaps, but the controls are nice and responsive. The ability to move diagonally allows for simpler repositioning without having to turn your back on the enemy and flee, like how practically all of the fights in the first Legacy of Goku game played out. Defeating Frieza, Gohan wakes up to reveal that it was all a dream. What a twist, even though I spoiled it before, but... You're spoiling it! You're spoiling everything! Gohan feels that Frieza has returned, and then the telephone rings. It's Krillin. It seems that he felt the same thing. The Z Fighters are putting together a plan to meet up near where Frieza is landing in order to maybe stop him. Before we go, we take the Saiyan armor that Gohan had hidden in a cave. We proceed to a large signpost that takes us to the world map. This is where the flying has been reintroduced. Flying on the world map allows you to visit various locations. The main quest will be highlighted with a gold star so you always know where to go to advance the story forwards. We descend into the northern wastelands where we have to fight our way through mobster tigers and little robots. Defeating foes will give you experience points which you will want to do since levels will increase your stats. You can check your stats on the character screen in the pause menu. Stats can also be increased by using capsules located all throughout the world. They are a one time use item with a permanent stat increase. Another handy feature to leveling up is that upon reaching the next level, all of your health and key will be fully restored. We finally meet up with the rest of the Z Fighters. Frieza and his father King Cold make their way to Earth. When they arrive on Earth they are met by Trunks who transforms into a Super Saiyan and effortly defeats not just all of Frieza's soldiers but also Frieza himself as well as his father. This entire encounter takes place in a cutscene instead of you getting to fight Frieza and King Cold. I can sort of see why they didn't make this part playable, especially since we recently had a boss fight against Frieza, and they'd have to make Trunks really powerful in this fight just to get the scene right, but I still think it was a bit of a missed opportunity, because it would have been nice to have gone to fight against King Cold, who appears very seldom in games. Now, I'm sure you're all wondering why I brought you here. Snacks! To kill us! To kill Snacks! Trunks explains after the fight that Goku is about to return to Earth. Goku in fact does and lands close to where everyone was waiting a short time later. Trunks then tells Goku about the future in which the androids arrive and slaughter all of the Z Fighters in a massive battle. He offers Goku heart medication to help him fight off a heart virus that he would eventually contract. He also instructs Goku not to tell anyone about his parents, Vegeta and Bulma. <laughs> What's so funny? The remainder of the Z Fighters are notified of the android danger, which motivates them to train hard for the next three years. Gohan returns home with his father. From here we are free to roam around for a bit. When exploring certain areas of the map, there will be a jar icon in the upper right corner. 
This signifies that the animals in the region have been contaminated by Garlic Jr's black water mist. This is the game's method of integrating the Garlic Jr saga without really having to include it, which is fine with me. For those who are unaware, the Garlic Jr saga was an anime exclusive filler arc, which I always dreaded when it appeared on TV. Like much filler in the anime, it contributes nothing to the story and merely serves to fill the time, therefore I'm glad that the game chooses to pass over it. These places do contain some capsules, but they are largely utilised for grinding character levels, which I'll go into more depth a little bit later on because I have a lot to say about that. Mm -hmm. Even though Goku just arrived home, he decides that it is already time for us to leave for training. Husband of the year. I have no idea how you're still married. We're headed for West City to find Piccolo. Why would Piccolo be in West City, you might ask? Well, the thing you have to understand about that is... It is here we are introduced to the arbitrary missions that we will be given to progress through the game. As in the first game, we will face numerous hurdles that will impede our progress through the story. Most of them, like this one, make no sense. Hercule is staging a parade across town, but they have come to a halt because Hercule is craving an open-faced club sandwich. We don't give a shit about this, but we do care about meeting up with Piccolo, who is waiting behind the parade float that is blocking the road. Instead of simply flying over it, we must now complete a series of fetch quests. This includes going to an electronics store, delivering a newspaper, and saving a group of kids who were nearly killed in a bus crash. After that, we can grab a sandwich and offer it to Hercule, who will move the parade float out of the way. Now I have no issue in having to do little missions in order to progress the story. My issue with this game's quest is that they're all pretty much the same. They usually just involve you finding something and bringing it to the right place. My other issue with them is that the reasons for stopping progression is kind of dumb. Gohan can fly, this isn't a secret. I mean they could have come up with something just a little bit better. You know maybe think about it a little like 10 seconds more come up with something. Okay, that's my issue. We meet with Piccolo whom we can now play as. Despite the game's title, The Legacy of Goku, Goku is barely present. Which makes a lot of sense if you're familiar with the Android slash Cell saga. We get to see the story through the perspective of numerous characters, which allows for a lot more detail because we aren't limited to just one. This was one of the first game's greatest flaws. Dragon Ball Z features a vast ensemble cast, and being limited to simply playing as Goku made the game not only very short, but also quite disconnected. Capsule Corp branded platforms can be found all over the world. They serve as save points as well as the means of switching between characters. The main disadvantage of this approach is that if you need to change characters halfway through a level, you must either continue playing and hope to discover a new save point, or backtrack through a level to a prior save location. This occurs frequently since certain areas can only be accessed by certain characters. In terms of what is going on right now in the story, not a whole lot. As Piccolo, we can enter this jungle area and help out a farmer who is having a dinosaur problem. They are trampling his crops and we must stop them since we require a key to enter this area, despite the fact that we could simply fly over the wall. Okay, I'm gonna stop whining about this now, but you get my point. I know I applauded the game earlier for omitting the Garlic Junior Saga filler, but they have effectively replaced it with different filler, which isn't especially compelling. After finishing all of the tasks in West City, we are faced by Cooler, who is on the lookout for Goku. We won't be able to battle him right now, because he'll be waiting for us on New Namek. How do we get to New Namek? This is a good time to discuss the game's two collection quests. The first entails locating 25 golden capsules. These can be found laying on the ground in the wild, in buildings, or given to you for completing side missions. The second goal is to locate 7 lost Namekians spread throughout the game world. Finding all 7 is how you gain passage to new Namek, but they are spread out so widely throughout the game that these are one of the last things to be completed. Before leaving town, we pay a visit to Bomber at Capsule Corp. He provides us a scanner that serves as a map as well as a tool to scan enemies and NPCs to learn more about them. The scanning function isn't really that useful, at least I never really used it much. But the map is, as it marks where entrances are, save points and shows where you haven't been yet. After the 3 year time skip, each character gains a level and learns a new key move. We will now be able to switch between key techniques at any time. 
It's possible to charge up and unleash a more powerful blast by holding down the button. Depending on the attack, a different amount of key is needed. A wide range of techniques are available for each character and they all have their signature moves. On a Memo Island, we meet up with Yamcha, Tien and Bulma, who is carrying a baby. Goku advises her to go for her own safety, but she insists on seeing the androids first and then leaving. When Krillin inquires about the baby, Gohan guesses it's Yamcha's. Yamcha say that he is not the father. To Krillin and Gohan's surprise, Goku claims that Vegeta is the father and that the baby's name is Trunks. So then, where's daddy? Unfortunately, our last conversation was... You got me pregnant, you idiot! After waiting for a while, there still has been no sign of the androids. Yajirobe arrives with sensu beans from Korin and leaves after refusing to fight. The sensu beans can be used from the menu to completely refill your character's health and key. You are limited to only carrying three at a time, however you can get more from Korin by trading him three fish for a sensu bean. Realizing that they won't be able to sense the androids, they decide to descend down into the city and search for them the old fashioned way. Wandering around for a bit, Yamcha is ambushed by the two androids. They destroy a section of the city before Goku convinces them to fight in a more secluded spot. The game then cuts to follow Vegeta, who is training to become a Super Saiyan. He finally achieves the form and returns to Earth to aid in the battle against the androids. Goku begins his battle with Android 19 as we make our way to the arena. Goku's heart virus is starting to take a toll on him as we approach the battle. He was warned about this by Trunks, but it didn't happen until much later than he had predicted. This is because Trunks' meddling within the timeline had inadvertently altered events. Vegeta arrives just in time. Hey, Vegeta! Kakarot, you idiot! What are you doing? Dying? Mostly. And we get to fight Android 19. When Vegeta achieves Super Saiyan, it was also unlocked for us to use during gameplay. To turn Super Saiyan, you must obviously be playing as a character that could turn Super Saiyan, but also this yellow gauge must be filled. It merely acts as a cooldown timer and fills up automatically over a short period of time. Another requisite to transforming is having key. There is no set amount of key that you need to have, but the fuller the key gauge, the longer you can maintain the transformation. While Super Saiyan, your movement speed is increased and all of your attacks do more damage. The key gauge will gradually drain while in this form until it is empty and you revert back to normal. The transformation can be prolonged by collecting key orbs and eating sensu beans. It does take a bit of time to transform, so you want to do so in a safe place because if you are interrupted mid-transformation, you will be thrown back into the cooldown period before you can try again. Transformations are a great addition to the gameplay, and I appreciate that the requirements for them aren't too stringent that you never get to utilise them. When you can transform, it's usually worth it, even if it's merely to enhance your movement speed. Vegeta easily dispatches Android 19, and we pursue Android 20 who has fled. As Vegeta, we can easily overtake and defeat him. In an attempt to activate Android 17 and 18, he scrambles away before we can destroy him. Upon his arrival, Trunks is taken aback to learn that androids 19 and 20 aren't the same androids he warned the Sea Fighters about three years ago. This comes as a complete shock to everyone. At this moment, Vegeta realises that the boy from the future is actually his son's future self, thanks to Piccolo calling Trunks by his name. Bulma then remembers seeing Dr. Jiro's picture in one of her father's science magazines, indicating that Android 20 is actually Dr. Jiro, who rebuilt himself as an android. Bulma also recalls reading about Dr. Jiro's laboratory, which is located somewhere in the northern mountains. As we pursue Android 20 across the mountains, we begin to encounter a few of these numbered coloured barriers. Each colour represents a different character and the number is the level that the character must reach before they can get past the barrier. I am not a fan of this system. Like at all. It feels like an arbitrary roadblock to progression. It takes one of the game's best aspects, which is getting to play as multiple characters, and makes it a bit of a chore. Since they all level up separately, it forces you to have to do a lot of grinding if you haven't been playing as a certain character for a while. Honestly, if you want to 100% this game, a lot of your playtime is going to be spent grinding. The berries prevent you from entering places with too many high level enemies, but they also prevent those with the skill from passing through and progressing at their own pace. 
After all, this is an action adventure game, and I believe that if you've mastered the mechanics enough to get through a challenging section, you should be able to do so regardless of the level. The majority of locations that are walled off are optional, but there are a handful that are not, and it can really ruin the game's pacing. We must locate and destroy three power generators in order to deactivate the laser gate that is barring our path further into the mountains. Two aren't too difficult to find and destroy, but the third one requires you to play this rather frustrating mission game. There's this dinosaur okay, that has made her nest around the generator for some stupid reason and will only leave if we bring all three of her eggs down the hill. Sounds easy right? Wrong! Because while carrying an egg you cannot melee attack or use key and you cannot under any circumstance take damage or the egg will break and you will have to start all over again. If an enemy so much as scrapes by you too bad, broken eggs start again. As soon as the enemy gets a whiff of you, they will make a beeline to your location and it's probably already too late. This is the worst mission in the entire game. It's hard, it's frustrating as hell, it's not fun, and worst of all, you have to do it three times. Three. By destroying all of the generators, we are able to get through the gate and uncover the door to Dr. Jerome's lab, but we're too late, he's already turned on the other androids. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Dr. Jerome's orders are ignored by 17 and 18, who instead activate another android, Android 16. In an attempt to stop them, Trunks blows up the lab. <coughs> With the androids free to roam around the world, we track them down and try to stop them before they can cause any trouble. For the fight against 18, it doesn't matter who you play, because when you bring her down to about half health, the fight will end and you automatically lose, but at least Krillin gets a peck on the cheek. No matter if you're playing as Vegeta or not, he will get all butt hurt and fly off. We must travel to the lookout to persuade Kami to fuse with Piccolo so he can obtain enough power to fight the androids. Kami needs some time to think about this though. In the meantime, Trunks and Gohan head out to investigate a second time machine that was spotted in the forest. This is the first time since the prologue that we get to play as Trunks. I love how the devs went to the trouble of changing the sprites of the characters to resemble what they looked like at the time in the anime, for the most part. Not all the time. All of the character sprites look great, with a few exceptions. They don't look derpy like some of the character portraits. They all have unique animations for their attacks and movements, with the standout animations being the transformations. They look pretty good. The only thing that they are missing is the aura around the characters. Overall, the graphics are really good, especially for a Game Boy Advance game. The environments are detailed and vibrant, although some of the areas do look a little bit too similar, making it a bit harder to remember which regions certain things are in when revisiting levels. But this is definitely not the case for the more iconic locations, like Kami House and the Lookout, which look fantastic. The Lookout especially, which is quite large, you can even fly down to visit Corrin. The game uses Bruce Faulkner's music and it is just amazing. It fits perfectly with the tone of the game and gives me some serious nostalgia from the dub that I watched as a kid. We discover the time machine Trunks used to travel here is the same model as the one sitting in the forest. However, the fact that it's completely grown over suggests that it's been sitting here for some time. Trunks believes that whoever was the one to use this time machine is the reason why the events in this timeline has changed so much. I mean, it's definitely not him. <laughs> While looking around the area, we come across an egg shell and the creature's husk that had hatched from it. Meanwhile, Kami has picked up on the emergence of a new threat and has decided that the time has come for him to join forces with Piccolo. Well, I'm sure you're already familiar with the technique. Right. All right now. Lower. Yeah, not falling for that. Hm. I didn't think so. Piccolo's transformation is now available to him thanks to the fusion. It works in a similar way to the Super Saiyan transformations but with the extra benefit of health regen. The animation when he removes his headgear and cloak is one of my favourites. After gaining a few levels, we make our way into Ginger Town where we come across all these abandoned clothes on the ground. Hello, friend. Our first encounter with Imperfect Cell is pretty easy since we only need to bring him down to half health. He manages to blow off one of Piccolo's arms, but we are able to get him to start monologuing. 
Using the strongest warrior's cells, Dr. Giraud built Cell, a flawless fighting machine. When he saw the project was taking too long, Dr. Giraud decided to call it quits. The project was then secretly carried out by a supercomputer. It was designed to catch the DNA of Goku, Vegeta and Piccolo as they fought on Earth. Frieza, who arrived on Earth and was killed by future Trunks, had his DNA taken as well, with many other fighters having their most effective strategies and abilities copied from them. Imperfect Cell admits that his primary goal is to absorb the infinite power cores of both Android 17 and 18 and achieve his perfect form. With Android 17 and 18 destroyed in his timeline, Imperfect Cell decided to steal Trunks' time machine by killing another version of future Trunks and to come back to this time. Thanks to his monologuing, you sly dog, you got me monologuing. Piccolo has time to regenerate his arm. More of the Z fighters arrive to help, and Cell ends up flying off. Trunks and Krillin then decide to return to Dr. Jiro's lab to destroy Cell before he has time to grow. We're aborting Cell. Goku has been recuperating from the heart virus at the Kame House. He's out of bed and back to his old self. Bring the mess. So will we finally be playing as Goku? Well, no. We are going to the lookout to take advantage of the hyperbolic time chamber where we can complete a year's worth of training in a single day. Vegeta being impatient as ever insists on going in first, so Vegeta and Trunks are the first to enter the chamber. Move it boy! Help me! Have fun Trunks! In the meantime Piccolo must try to buy some time. So he travels to the Kami house to confront the androids who have arrived on the island in search of Goku. If the androids are destroyed before Cell can absorb them, he will be unable to achieve his perfect form. We agree to relocate to a more remote location and begin fighting Android 17. And the fight plays out pretty much how every other fight in the game plays out. This is one of the fighting mechanics flaws. The best defense is a good offense due to the fact that there isn't really a way to play defensively. There there's no dedicated dodge move and you cannot block attack so all the fights usually just evolve into trading punches with each other. You can use key attacks but you're better off preserving your key for maintaining your transformation. When you punch an opponent they will get knocked back giving you a small window to follow up with another attack. If you time your punches right you can keep them in the stun state and get in a lot of damage without them being able to retaliate. I found this strategy to work against every boss no matter what character I was playing as. Paired with the mandatory level grinding it makes the bosses is pretty trivial. This isn't to say that playing the game isn't enjoyable despite these issues. Sal tricks us down before he can destroy any of the androids and Seventeen gets absorbed, allowing Sal to achieve his semi-perfect form. With Piccolo down and out, Tien arrives to give Android 18 a chance to escape. Tien almost forever sleeps himself trying to hold off Sal before Goku uses his instant transmission to save him and Piccolo. Vegeta and Trunks emerge from the hyperbolic time chamber with newfound strength. And with his enhanced power, we track down Cell on some islands where he is currently on a quest for Android 18. Both Trunks and Vegeta acquire their ascended Super Saiyan form after training in the chamber, and this game is the best at demonstrating the advantages and disadvantage of this form entirely through its gameplay. When in this state, your attack receives a large damage boost, but you feel extremely slow and sluggish when moving around. The speed for power trade-off is undoubtedly worth it during boss fights, but wow do you miss the traditional Super Saiyan form while traveling around? Because Vegeta believes in his own hype too much, I am the hype! He lets Cell absorb Android 18, transforming him into perfect Cell and promptly defeating Vegeta. Despite the fact that in the game we are kicking Cell's ass, this fight is unwinnable, as at a certain health threshold, the fight will stop with Trunks lamenting that he is too slow. That is when Cell decides that instead of taking them out right then and there, that he is going to host a martial arts tournament in 10 days, the Cell Games. Left beaten and broken on the island shores, the gang decides to bring Android 16 to Capsule Court so he can be repaired, as he may be useful in the fight against Cell. During the repairs, it is found that Android 16 had a bomb inside of him that if set off would cause devastating destruction. To be on the safe side, they remove it. Hope they don't regret that. Goku and Gohan emerge from the hyperbolic time chamber and are quickly brought up to date with the current situation. Because Kami is now gone, they need a new Namekian guardian in order to bring back the Dragon Balls. Goku instant transmissions to new Namek and brings back Dende. Dende restores the Dragon Balls that are now capable of granting three wishes, though this could be reduced to two if one wish took too much effort. Finally, we are able to play as Goku.
near the end of the game. We used the remaining days before the tournament to track down the seven dragon balls. To help with this task we can talk to Bulma who will give us the dragon radar. Most of the dragon balls can be found just lying around in levels and behind barriers that we previously couldn't pass through, such as in the northern mountain where we must be level 40 as Goku to get in. There are a bunch of dinosaurs to fight through in order to reach the dragon ball. This is a great place to grind out levels as all the enemies give out a lot of experience. I spent so much time here, it's not even funny. In the snowy highlands there is a sort of mini dungeon to navigate through. At the end of the dungeon we will face off against General Tao. He is really easy to beat and our reward is the 4 star Dragon Ball. With all of the Dragon Balls collected it is now time to take on the Cell Games. You have to be a minimum of level 40 with Goku to even enter the Cell Games arena. Which gives you a bit of a hint of what the game roughly expects all of the other characters to be at. Hercule is here getting ready to take credit for all of our hard work. Oh fuck. When the tournament commences, Goku decides that he will be the first one to fight. Because we are at such a high level, the next few fights are honestly really easy. This is a bit of a problem with a leveling system like this. It is really easy to trivialize a lot of the fights even if you don't intend to. Goku gives up and decides to send his young son out to fight. Father of the year everyone. Once again the fight plays out pretty much like all of the others. Just keep punching. Android 16, being the gentleman that he is, I want to murder Son Goku. Yeah, fuck Goku. Tries to stop Cell by blowing up the bomb that is inside of him. But unfortunately, it has been removed. Whoops. Cell then summons his children to take out the other Z fighters, as yet another bunch of easy fights. We do get to fight with all of the other characters, which is a really nice touch, giving all of the characters a bit of a spotlight during the climax of the game. At this point, Hercule uncovers the head of Android 16, which, surprisingly, can still talk. Android 16 pleads with Hercule to take him near Gohan. Hercule obliges despite his fear and the android's head lands between Gohan and Cell. Android 16 delivers some counsel and words of encouragement to Gohan, saying it was good to fight sometimes, to defend loved ones and to safeguard the world he loves. Perfect Cell then destroys Android 16's head. Gohan snaps. <laughs> With his rage reaching its boiling point, he is pushed to a new level of power, Super Saiyan 2. Since Gohan is now invincible, you can beat the living daylights out of Cell, causing him to spew out Android 18, Ugh, yuck. reverting him back to his semi-perfect form. Unfortunately, Cell does not take defeat well and initiates a self-destruct sequence powerful enough to wipe out the planet. Goku utilizes his instant transmission ability to transport him away, at the expense of his own life and King Kai's. Hey King Kai, what should I do with Cell? Ah! Ah! God, my fucking knee! That's my knee! Damn it! But Cell is able to regenerate and using a single key blast he impales Trunks and kills him. Goku communicates to Gohan from the other world via King Kai. Goku encourages Gohan to believe in his power and with newfound hope, Gohan prepares one last Kamehameha. The beam struggle between the two combatants is intense. Suddenly a surprise gallop blaster from Vegeta leaves Cell stunned and very distracted. Gohan seizes the opportunity, encouraged by Goku, and unleashes all of the rest of his strength into the Kamehameha wave, which overwhelms Cells and elopes him in the enormous energy, fully disintegrating him. After the battle ends, the heroes make their way to Kami's lookout. The Z fighters attempt to wish Goku back to life after wishing all of Cell's victims back, but fail to revive Goku because he had already been wished back to life once before and Shenron cannot revive a person more than once. However, Goku decides to stay in the other world after explaining that he seems to attract evil people, so it would be better for the Earth to live in peace without him. Gohan returns home in a post credit scene plays out where Trunks returns to his timeline and kills both of the androids and Cell. And that's it for the main story. I must say this game has a really substantial story mode. I did brush over a lot of the smaller details of the campaign, but it will take the average player a good 12 to 15 hours to complete. Unlike with a lot of Dragon Ball Z games, you don't necessarily need to know the story beforehand in order to be able to understand what is going on. Of course it obviously does help, 
but it is by no means necessary. The weakest aspect of the main campaign has to be the pacing. The filler type missions paired with the mandatory grinding can really slow down the progression. But just because we're done with the story doesn't mean that we're done with the game, as we still have some side content to complete. During the post game, you will no longer be able to play as Goku. Fortunately, it is mandatory for you to open all of the areas exclusive to Goku before the end, so you can't lock yourself out of content. First, we are going to finish collecting all of the golden capsules. Collecting all of them and bringing them to Professor Briefs will reward you with a gold capsule that lets you access the overworld map at any point. Well, I guess not at any point, as you can't do so from interiors. Next, we are going to search for the missing Namekians. Once we have found all seven, we return to the ship near the Capsule Corporation and speak with the scientist. He'll ask us to accompany the refugees home to New Namek. When we arrive, we can talk to this guy right outside of the ship that will give us the key to Grandpa Gohan's house. Inside the house, we can grab the plus five power, strength and endurance capsules. Next, we head into a cave just outside of the settlement. Here, we'll finally be able to fight Cooler. Despite him being an endgame boss, he isn't particularly difficult. Once he's dead, collect the plus five capsule that he drops and head through the door to the north. Here we have a level 50 piccolo barrier. What's behind the barrier? Well, a trophy. Now what are these trophies for, you may ask? Each character has their own trophy associated with them. All of the trophies are behind level 50 barriers, meaning that you need to grind up all of the characters to level 50 to collect all of the trophies. Yay! Except for Goku, whose trophy is awarded to you just for finishing the game. Collecting all of the trophies will unlock Hercule as a playable character. Hercule has absurdly low stats, but his special ability which allows him to freeze time means that he can eventually take out just about any enemy. Eventually. And after this, there is even more grinding to do, if you want the secret ending. Look, I've already gone over my gripes with the grinding in this game. And like I said before, it's not that I hate grinding, I just do not like the way this game implements it. When you are grinding, you're just gaining levels. There are no rare items that might have a chance of dropping from an enemy. You don't learn new skills, it's just killing enemies over and over again. And with Hercule's terrible stats, it just accentuates the monotony of this system. I never got to level 50 with Hercule as a kid. I originally played the game on the original Game Boy Advance, so there's no way I had enough batteries for this. The grind is not worth it at all. So all you get is a cutscene with Hercule lying in an interview about how he was the one that defeated Cell. Lame. Dragon Ball Z The Legacy of Goku 2 is leaps and bounds above its predecessor. Almost all of the issues with the first game have been addressed and fixed. It honestly makes the legacy of Goku 1 look like a proof of concept and this is the actual game. Despite a few gripes with the leveling system and the pacing in certain areas not being the best, this is a really solid game. The controls are great, there are plenty of areas to explore and the storytelling is pretty competent all things considered. I even think that non-Dragon Ball Z fans will find a lot to like about this game. Goku's legacy has definitely been redeemed with this game, even though he's hardly even in it. Dragon Ball Z The Legacy of Goku 2 is way better than the first game, because the first game was fucking shit. Okay, bye.